So uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Decoding COVID-19 virtual seminar today. Uh, the medical school at Brown has established this uh, seminar series uh, to help us learn the very best possible ways uh, to care for uh, patients with this uh, unfortunate disease. Today, uh, we'll be talking about issues in and problems with uh, ethics relating to uh, COVID-19. It's my uh, great pleasure today to introduce to you Robert Arnold. Uh, Bob is a distinguished service professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. He's chief of the palliative care and medical ethics section of the Division of General Internal Medicine and director of the uh, Institute for Doctor-Patient Communication there. Uh, Bob uh, got his uh, MD at the University of Missouri and we're proud to claim him as a graduate of the Brown Primary Care Internal Medicine Training Program. I believe it was based at Rhode Island Hospital and the VA at that time. And so it's a special pleasure to have one of our uh, alumni coming and uh, talking to us about these terribly important problems uh, that we've been dealing with with COVID ethics. So thank you so much, Bob. So I'm thrilled uh, to be here, uh, which is largely my office, uh, given the world these days. I do want to acknowledge uh, that Pittsburgh has been a very low prevalence uh, city, despite my lack of a haircut uh, in three months. And so I'm, um, I'm going to tell you some things. We're going to talk about a number of different issues. We're going to start off talking about uh, allocation and some of the problems with the most prominent allocation policy that got uh, promulgated for distributing ventilators and show you how it's changed uh, in uh, the policy that has now come up for distributing uh, antiretrovirals for COVID. We're then gonna talk some about communication issues and some work that I've been doing with a nonprofit called Vital Talk and some material for uh, clinicians about how to handle the very tough conversations. We're gonna talk a little bit about what my experience has been as in some ways the biggest ethical issue, uh, which for families has been about identity. And then we're gonna end uh, on a real downer talking about how I think in fact, the uh, pandemic has shown uh, problems with our society that I'm not sure that I have a great solution for. Now, I wrote this talk about two weeks ago, and then yesterday uh, I have been uh, so distressed uh, that I uh, decided that I needed to rewrite uh, this talk uh, because it feels tone deaf to talk about what's going on in ethics in COVID and not talk about what's going on um, in Minneapolis. Uh, and so I've changed the beginning of this talk. Uh, and at the beginning of this talk, I'm just going to point out some comparisons between COVID and racism. Um, I hope that uh, as a very old white male, I'll get, uh, I do this from a point of not much knowledge of the world and yet uh, a feeling that I couldn't ignore in a talk uh, to uh, clinicians uh, who care about public health, which is why you're watching this. I couldn't just go start in on a talk about COVID. 
And so I want to do some comparisons on COVID versus racism. Uh, because if you read the medical journals, there have been an, a number of articles about COVID. There have been hundreds of millions, if not trillions of dollars focusing on how we're dealing with COVID and how we're dealing with the fallout of COVID. And it just seems to me that we ought to compare it uh, to the world that we now live in. COVID's been around for about three or four months. There have been 100,000 American deaths and unemployment has been about 23%. There will be an opportunity at some point for a vaccine. Now, if you look at COVID and the intersection of COVID and African Americans, despite being 13 to 14% of the American population, they're 30% of the infections and have had much higher rates of hospitalization and deaths. Moreover, they've had significantly higher rates of unemployment and financial impact from COVID. If you look at racism, it's been around for over 200 years. It's associated with lower life expectancies and higher mortalities for most diseases. It's associated with process outcomes regarding getting opiates and being uh, listened to by your doctor and uh, much lower satisfaction with communication with your physician. It's uh, associated with a much higher risk of being uh, in prison, a greater than 25% lifetime risk, higher rates of unemployment, and there is no vaccine. And so I don't have a solution for any of this, and yet it feels to me that if as a group of healthcare providers, we are going to talk about this, and I will come back to this at the end, we need to really think about what the biggest public health concerns are. And I would love to hear from those of you who have more experience and knowledge and come from minority communities about medicine, because if you look at being a, a physician, at least in medicine, the rates of African-American physicians is much lower than the population would suggest. I'm a palliative care doctor and we just did a study looking at uh, medical schools with high percentages of underrepresented minorities and medical schools with low percentages of underrepresented minorities. Medical schools with higher percentages of underrepresented minorities had less training in palliative care, were less likely to have rotations in palliative care, were less likely to have fellowships in the specialty of palliative care. And if we believe that concordance between the patient and the physician's race is associated with more trust and better communication satisfaction, it seems to me this is a humongous problem in addition to all the other problems that I noted. So I'm gonna pause for a second because I know that there are 82 of you who at least have your uh, computer turned on and I'm getting paid by chat question. I'm not really, um, but I would love to hear a reaction to this because at least for those of us who are in Pittsburgh in general medicine and palliative care, while COVID is an issue, what's happened over the last weekend and the issues that come up over the last weekend have turned out to be at least that big an issue. So I'm gonna give people 30 seconds to either respond or ask questions. So the racism issue in other countries is uh, really interesting. It varies a great deal. It's less about African-Americans. It's more about uh, 
immigrants and uh, it seems more associated with uh, right-wing political structures. I'm not a political scientist. It's a great question. Uh, the rates of COVID are higher with, uh, in underrepresented minorities, I would argue, because of the living context uh, and uh, be, because at least in New York City, uh, if you, the number, the density of the population is higher, it's way easier to spread. We've seen this in nursing homes and it is gonna get to my very next issue, which is the allocation of scarce resources. Uh, Doug White, who's at the University of Pittsburgh, has worked for a very long time on the allocation of scarce resources, in particular ventilators. And he wrote an article almost eight to 10 years ago, and then wrote a very big article in New England Journal, and I'm sorry, in JAMA, talking about the criteria that would be used to prioritize ventilators if there was a public health emergency. And the criteria, what he said is, look, what we really want to do is look at the public health impact, which is the most lives saved. And so the criteria that Doug used to, prior to prioritize is basically survival to discharge. That was the number one thing that he focused on. He looked at if there were tiebreakers or bumps, you would get a bump based on stages of life. And his argument was that people who had never lived very long in their life, we have a sort of fair games play that if you've lived, if you're in the ninth inning and other people are only in the first or second inning, they should get more priority if we have to prioritize. And he said, if you have an essential responsibility in a pandemic for saving lives, that people who had essential responsibility should get a bump. That we should look at everyone, we shouldn't rule anyone out, but that we should have an allocation framework that basically, if you read his article, you can get up to eight points, and we, you can get three points for three different things. One is the acute illness severity indicator, and they use the SOFA score. And they basically said the sicker you are, the higher, the more points you would get, because if it looked like that you would get by without a ventilator at all, that was really good. We wanted to, if you, we wanted to give people ventilators who looked like they would most likely survive. If your SOFA score was so high that it looked like you would die regardless of you got the ventilator, you were less likely to get a ventilator. The second thing you could get up to three points for is having a longer term survival. And they broke it in if you died within the, were likely to die of your comorbid condition within the first year, you got fewer points. They then said five to 10 years and greater than 10 years because it was just hard to predict prognostically. Then they looked and you got points if you, were, if you were doing tasks vital to the public health response. And if there was a tie, the tiebreaker was where you were in the life cycle. Okay. So in fact, not only was this a widely recognized article, but the state of Pennsylvania adopted this model. The state of Maryland adopted this model. Across the country, people were very interested in this model. When you try, I'm now going to talk to you about all the criticisms of this model, because one of the things that happens in philosophy is you have a really good idea. And oh my god, Doug is one of the smartest bioethicists I know. And yet, once you began to operationalize the acute illness predictors, it became very, very hard. So for example, in the beginning of the pandemic, if you were COVID positive, they wouldn't run your blood in the same lab. There were all these practical problems. And one of the things that SOFA requires 
is knowing what the creatinine was. And so then what you would have, because I sat on this committee, you would have us try to figure out what the SOFA score would be given that we can't run a creatinine. So did you take the last creatinine before they got sick? Or did you take a creatinine when they were in the ED? And if they didn't have a creatinine, would you just give them three points because you weren't sure? That is, we had to try to figure out what to do with missing data. Second, as was pointed out by a number of individuals, although the SOFA score does not take into account anything about ethnicity. If you look at creatinines, for example, African Americans have higher rates of renal failure for a variety of reasons related to diabetes and hypertension than Caucasians do. And so although the, the score itself didn't discriminate, there was a lot of pushback because the impact of the score would be to discriminate based on ethnicity. Finally, we use the SOFA score because for non-COVID diseases, the SOFA score is a pretty good predictor of mortality. But there was some objection to using the COVID score, the SOFA score in COVID because there was little data on how it would work in COVID. Um, there is a question about how do you deal with this once you're on a ventilator? And we decided that getting a ventilator didn't mean that you got to stay on a ventilator. So while we would give you 72 hours at 72 hours, we would rescore every patient. And if patients came in and were in the emergency room or on the floor who were, had lower scores, people in the, in the ICU would lose their ventilator to these other patients. It's a problem in bioethics in allocation that we call the squatter problem. Now, the thing that made me the most crazy, I mean, you're listening to me, so you'll figure out how crazy I am to begin with, is the bump for essential workers. That was defined as those who play a role, a critical role in the chain of treating patients and maintaining social order. And the argument for essential workers, which largely turn out to be healthcare workers, was that they deserve a bump because they have higher rates of infection. In Allegheny County, 14% of COVID positive individuals are healthcare workers. And the argument was that they won't show up without a bump. If you didn't tell them that if they got really sick, they would get to be on a ventilator, the worry was that they wouldn't come to work. This has to do with, and I don't know what it's like in, in in Providence, this phrase, uh, healthcare heroes, which is like all over Western Pennsylvania. And in fact, as I will argue, makes me a little uncomfortable. And here's why it makes me uncomfortable. I don't know what an essential provider is. Okay, doctors in the hospital, nurses in the hospital, first responders are in the hospital. But I have to say, I'm a doctor. And since this has happened, I've largely turned into a Zoom user. I, I, my outpatients never come. I Zoom them. I have Zoom meetings. I'm not in the emergency room. When I'm in the hospital, the COVID positive patients are on a separate unit that I don't get to go to. It's unclear that my risk is that high. Second, what about all the other people who stand up healthcare? I'm talking about, yes, the people who bring the food in every room, the cleaning people, the people who take patients 
from one part of the hospital to the next part of the hospital. The cleaning people in long-term care facilities. Not only that, what about all the other people who stand up society? That is, the people who work in the grocery store, the people who work at gas stations, the people who in fact work in all the other things that are the, the garbage people. To a certain extent, it, I worry about the equity issue of giving a bump to the doctors, nurses, first providers and calling us heroes and calling everybody else who goes to work every day, calling them not heroes and not giving them a bump. It seems to me that if we're going to write a policy, which is a policy written largely by healthcare providers, we should be really careful about giving a bump for us and not giving a bump for all the other people who stand up to society. Moreover, it seems to me really hard to operationalize. What if I'm a nurse who works in an outpatient clinic and I haven't gone to work since this all happened? What if I'm a healthcare provider who works at home how do we know what your job is or whether you, your job involves any risk at all? Do you only get a bump if you go to work? Second, we've argued, or part of the argument was that essential workers, healthcare providers won't show up without a bump. And I think our experience has shown that that's just not right. When you looked at what happened in New York City, when they asked retired clinicians to come to work to help provide care, tens of thousands of retired doctors and nurses stood up. If you look at the number of doctors who flew from California and Pittsburgh to New York and Detroit, they didn't ask whether they got a bump. They viewed it as their role and their job as a healthcare provider who in fact are trusted by others and chose this job as a calling, they showed up. It would seem to me that if I was worried about whether people were gonna go to work or not, if they didn't get a bump, I'd worry more about the grocery store attendants who don't view their job as a bump. Finally, I worry that external incentives may decrease our internal uh, incentives to do our job. And you may say, what does that mean? Well, the argument in social psychology has been that if I give you money to do things that you're doing because it, you view it as your job, the incentives, in fact, may make you less likely to do your job. Let me give you an example. If my best friend called me up and said to me, I need to go out of town, please come over and watch my kids. I would say, of course, that's what best friends do. On the other hand, if my best friend called me up and said, hey, listen, if you come over and watch my kids, I'll give you $10 an hour. I'd be like, what is wrong with you? I'd be less likely to go watch his kids because I would be insulted that they feel like they need to give me something to quote, bribe me to do something that I feel like I should do because it's my identity. And there is some social psychologic data that external incentives decrease internal motivations. 
finally, I would argue that these aren't the right internal, external incentives. Because when I've talked to clinicians, they're not worried about whether they get COVID or get sick. What they're worried about is whether their spouse or parents who are living with them should get COVID and get sick. And so not only do I think that these external incentives decrease internal motivation, I would argue that if you're really gonna build external incentives because you need them, the external incentives shouldn't be that I get a bump. It should be that my family, if they get infected, they get a bump. Uh, external motivators buyer and they worry about family infectivity. Okay, so Doug White is a brilliant person. And so we had a chance to write a new allocation policy for remdesivir. And what's interesting is that a whole bunch of the complexity of the first policy went away. Remdesivir is going to be allocated based on a weighted lottery, looking only at three things. One is, are you an essential worker as defined by the governor of the state of Pennsylvania? That means that we don't care if you're a healthcare provider. If the governor said you're an essential worker when this started and you needed to go to work to stand up society, you got a bump. If you live in an underdeveloped area using the area deprivation index, you got a bump because we took seriously the fact that COVID seems to be more common and more deadly based on social economic status. And finally, if you were likely to die in the next year, based on your comorbid conditions, you got a decrease. And here, what I mean by a weighted lottery is, I don't know if any of you sort of follow the NBA, but if you, the way the NBA does their lottery is a weighted lottery. So the team who had the worst record gets four balls. The team that had the second worst record got three balls. The team that got the third worst record got two balls, and then the next four teams get one ball. You put them all in the ball mixer upper, and you choose a ball. And that's how you choose who gets the number one draft pick, and that's how we would choose who got from Desivir. My point here is twofold. First, a policy that theoretically I thought was a great policy, which was Doug's first policy, when you shone the light of operationalization on it, it turned out that it did things that we didn't agree with. The revised policy is both simpler and I think philosophically way more justifiable. And it tried to take into account social justice in the allocation process questions about part one. Okay, so part two is I'm uh, largely a clinician educator who's interested in communication. And it seemed to me that when we began to look at what the communication issues were in COVID, they were, oh, how did we decide the bump decrease amount? Uh, basically, uh, it was 0.25% or 25%. And I don't know how they decided that. I would argue that that's, uh, um, I don't think there's, you could argue about that. I think you just choose a number that isn't so high that it automatically means that if you're in the bump, you get it, and isn't so low that it doesn't have some effect. The communication issues that we looked at were advanced care planning, giving serious news to patients, goals of care in critically ill patients, and talking about bereavement. Now, I wanna point out to you that as a palliative care doctor, 
these, this is like my jam. This is what I deal with every day. So what's unique about this in COVID? I think what's unique is the trauma because it's not like with chronic illnesses, it just happened right now. So it was much more like trauma. The fear about what it would mean because we know so little prognostically, the fact that you couldn't see your loved one, all communication needed to be virtual, and loneliness and identity, which I'm gonna get back to. So Tony Bach, James Tosky and I, who are the founders of Vital Talk, basically decided that when this happened, what we needed to do was develop a, a sort of a list of phrases that we could as a community give to other clinicians. And so we put together a something that I'm going to show you later, which is basically a checklist of something that you could use to get you started in having these communication issues. And it was based on sort of four clear principles. One is that when you're giving serious news, give understandable headlines. Doctors aren't very good at giving understandable headlines. We are bad in, for two reasons. One is that given we don't speak normal English, we assume that people have higher health literacy than they in fact have. So for example, we expect that people have 10th, 11th, or 12th grade literacy where the average literacy is third, fourth, and fifth grade. To be even more explicit, 50% of Americans don't know what metastases are. And so when you talk about ventilators, or I had this great conversation when I was a resident with a patient about a breathing machine, and ventilators, and he wasn't sure whether I was talking about his inhaler that he used at home or whether he was talking about those machines on television. We need to give understandable headlines. So one of the things we did in sort of giving our guide is we tried to have headlines that were no more than two sentences. One sentence, what happened? The second sentence, what does it mean? Two, all serious conversations are about emotions. And as doctors, particularly, we're very good at trying to convey knowledge. We're not very good at attending to emotions. And so when families say things like, how can this be happening? We would often explain medically how it could be happening. They're not really asking how it could be happening. They're really saying, holy crud, why is this happening? I'm scared or upset. And so if emotions are key, recognizing the difference between a cognitive statement and emotional statement is important. And then just naming and acknowledging the emotion is really important. Three, that when you talk about what needs to be done, don't talk about tactics, talk about goals. Once you have agreement on goals, then you can talk about tactics. So for example, when you talk about tactics, do you want us to put your mom on a ventilator? First of all, who wouldn't, if your mom is short of breath and she won't live without a ventilator, do you think that's what she'd want? Who's willing to say, no, that isn't what my mom would want? She'd want to be short of breath. Or as we've seen and studies have shown that residents are no better than they were 20 years ago, people say, if your mom's heart stops, do you want us to try to restart it? And then when the family says yes, we try to talk them out of it, as opposed to if your mom was sitting here and could hear what we've been saying is wrong, what would be most important to her? What would she want to avoid? That is, I want you to start gathering goals and then offering strategies that you think will achieve those goals. Finally, 
I want to give you a way to talk about advanced care planning that after 30 years has finally worked with me. Because I would always talk about advanced care planning and people would be like, oh, do you think that's going to happen? And then we deal with what's going to happen and they can't be sure that it's going to happen and they don't want to talk about it because if they talk about it, then it might happen more frequently. And so I've stopped that. When people say, oh, do you really think we need to talk about it? I say, when your kids were little, did you talk to them about what to do if there was a fire in the house? And almost every parent says, oh yeah. And I say, did you want there to be a fire in the house? And they'd all look at me and smile and say, of course not. And I'd say, you decide to talk about it because if things happen that you didn't want to happen, you want to make sure they were prepared. That's how I think about advanced care planning. I hope we have the conversation and then we put it away and we look at it five years from now and say, thank goodness we didn't have to use that silly piece of paper. And yet, I want your kids to be prepared. I have to say, from going to about a 30% chance of getting people to be able to think about it, I've gone to probably an 80% chance of getting people to think about it. So what did we do? We put together a super concentrated blast of tips, and this is all free if you go to the vitaltalk.org website, of a communication playbook. And we looked at all the common issues that might come, and we crowdsourced it with the Vital Talk community, and we came up with about now a 10-page group of things that people might ask and how you might respond. We've given you some acronyms for how to use COVID as a starter for talking about goals of care. We've in uploaded it into the Vital Talk Tips app that is free on iOS and Android. And we gave you some videos so that you could see an expert clinician exactly have these conversations because this is all new and we haven't done this particularly virtually as often as we should have. Questions about that? If this is a This American Life talk, that's the second of four. The next is COVID and loneliness. But before I get to that, I wanna see if people have questions about the communication piece. Uh, there's a question about uh, uh, how, do, how does this relate to nursing home residents? The goal, uh, it doesn't, if you're in an area, if you're a nursing home, first of all, not all nursing homes are nursing homes. And so if the nursing home is in a disadvantaged area, then you would get a bump. You would not if you're not. Should the COVID conversation take place in the ED or the ICU? I would argue that the COVID conversation, given the way COVID is playing out, ought to take place for residents of nursing homes, for example. And the COVID conversation ought to take place by primary care doctors going through their patients who they say, ooh, this patient, if they got it, would do really not do well, and begin to reach out to those patients preventatively. Because I think it's hard if the EDs are overwhelmed like they were in New York City, it's hard to ask emergency medicine doctors to find the time to have these conversations. What happened at Mount Sinai is they stood up a telephonic palliative care program where basically the e emergency medicine physicians would call palliative care physicians and they would call the family. It was just too much to ask the emergency medicine doctors to do it. How does it provide better care? I think the communication provides better care in a couple of ways. One, it provides goal concordant care. That is, we need to make sure that we are doing the right thing for people based on their values. If I don't know what your values are, I'm not doing the right thing for you. And 
if I ask, I can provide better gold concordant care. If the convert, how does, uh, so that's how I would say it improves care. I also think it improves care for families. I think the thing that has been most distressing for families, and I'm gonna to get to that in a minute, is the loneliness and the feeling that they're unable to be good family members because they can't be with their loved ones. And the fact that we're involving them and we're keeping them in these conversations and we're helping them feel like they're being good husbands, wives, sons and daughters, I think means a lot. Now, is there data that it will decrease post-traumatic stress? There is not data. Uh, how, I would argue that it ought to be documented in how you normally document things. So at the University of Pittsburgh, we have a special form that it plays forward so that every time there is a conversation about goals, you can pull them up just like you would pull up all the last five creatinines because I worry that if you document them in an electronic record in the assessment and plan, no one will be able to know that it happened. Okay. Hospital policies regarding visitors, at least our hospital policy, is that we shut down completely. You could no longer come in and be with your loved one when they were in the hospital when the pandemic started. Now, there were some variations in this policy. If you were comfort measures only and COVID negative, and you call the chief nursing officer, you were able to come in. In New York, where I did some uh, COVID telephonic care, it very much depended on the hospital. I think there was a negative impact on patients that is we heard from a lot of patients that they were unwilling to go to the hospital because they worried that if they went to the hospital, their family wouldn't get to see them if they got sick. And in calling families, I have to tell you, way more distressing than the fact that their loved one might die was the fact that people couldn't be with their loved one. That is, what it is to be a good husband or wife or son or daughter is to be with your loved one when they are sick. I had a patient who had a lung transplant and then was on ECMO and we spent two hours a day talking to his wife who was just so distressed. She had been with her husband every day for every visit. And now he was delirious in the hospital and she couldn't help him. And she was just horrified. I think when you talk to healthcare providers, their moral distress at having really sick patients in the hospital and not having their loved ones be able to be there and have many of them die alone was extraordinarily problematic. Now, I think as COVID becomes a routine, some of this we're gonna fix because we're gonna have to open up hospitals. So at my hospital, you now can have one support person, whether you're COVID positive or not, come and be with you when you're in the hospital. That is, we've had to allow for some risk. We screen people before they come into the hospital. We require they wear a mask. We've made an ethical decision that we have to allocate PPE for families to be with their loved ones. I also think that we have a moral responsibility to come up with technological solutions. We have been able to stand up telehealth for hundreds, thousands of patients. We need to figure out ways to have iPads in rooms so that families can see their loved ones. We need to figure out how to put microphones in the room so that patients can talk to their loved one. 
because I think that if we don't do this, that for the foreseeable future, the sort of mental health risks for patients and families and healthcare providers are going to be enormous. Now, if you say to me, do you have any data? I would say no, and yet that's been my experience. My experience is that we need to help people, help families, let them be what gives them meaning in their life, which is to be good sons and daughters and husbands and wives. How can I, can I discuss optimizing resilience and well-being for healthcare providers? Um, I would argue, and it's probably a whole different talk, the issue here is integrating resilience. Uh, it's a very different model than helping people cope with stress. I think what helps people be more resilient is telling them that they can get through this is allowing them to get meaning out of their work and helping them uh, in ways that I think therapies like uh, acceptance commitment therapy and mindfulness therapy are really good at is not saying that you're not gonna be stressed. These are stressful times. It's how do we help you cope better with your stressors? I think the article uh, from medical teachers, a great one. I think that for those of you who are interested, I have found acceptance and commitment therapy. If you Google it under ACT, also to be very helpful. Finally, I think the thing that is most distressing to me is the degree to which COVID has shown fault lines in our society. This is not about medical ethics. This is about worrying about my children and my grandchildren. First, the role of scientific expertise and expertise in general over the last four to 10 years, I don't think it's all in the last four years, has clearly taken a big hit. For those of you who like podcasts, I would recommend you listen to Michael Lewis's podcast, Against the Odds, I'll type it in the chat, which his first season was all about how we no longer trust expertise in society. And he points out that even though decision-making has gotten better, there is less trust and are people who make decisions. From referees in basketball, where the probability that NBA referees make the right call is above 99%, and they watch every decision that they make, to judges, because we can look at every decision they make, and we can look at all the things that lead to decisions, our increased knowledge has less to, led to decreased trust. We've democratized knowledge via the internet. And we've seen this in the role of the doctor. It used to be that the role of the doctor was to make decisions and tell patients. Now when you see patients, they've read as much as you've often read and know the sort of sciencey stuff because there are 23 groups that they can get on for their disease. And so they're often very knowledgeable. My job now isn't so much to be the conveyor of knowledge. My job is to sort of be a travel guide where I help them make sense of all the knowledge that they have. If you don't believe me, read that 50% of Americans say that when there is a vaccine, that they won't take it. I find that to say very distressing things about the role of scientific expertise. I see Dr. Wortman's question, I'll get to it in a minute. Second, the 24 seven news cycle seems to me to be overwhelming all of us. 
when I asked people in Pittsburgh, the median age of a Pittsburghers who have died of Allegheny, have died of COVID, only one out of the probably 50 people I've asked have gotten it right. No one else is within 10 years because there's so much news and everybody talks about the unique cases that everybody thinks the median age is 50 or 60 or 70. In fact, it's 85. The fragmentation of news by interest groups along with a false consensus effect. The false consensus effect is the belief that everyone thinks the way that you think. And naive realism is that if you would only tell them the truth, they'd believe it as, as long as they're not being stupid. What this means is 24 seven news, the internet has the false consensus and naive realism has meant that nobody is talking to each other. We've, we have lost the sense of what it is to be a community. And so when I read Roxanne's gaze summary in her New York Times editorial, I'm like, oh my, I'm not sure how as a society, given the lack of belief and expertise, the degree to which the internet and the news cycle has split us apart. And what we already know about race and social determinants of health, that we are going to have a solution that will bring us together. And I don't think that getting through COVID or dealing with social determinants of health or dealing with racism are issues of science. I think they're issues of political will and community. And so I think, Dr. Wortman, the transformational changes that we need in healthcare aren't about healthcare. They're about society in general. I think that telehealth has some good things. It has some bad things. I think the degree to which healthcare is gonna be financially at risk. I, I'm, I'm not sure that we should focus on healthcare because healthcare doesn't work in a society that's not fair. And I think when you read from a really smart woman, the rest of the world yearns to get back to normal. For black people, normal is the very thing which we yearn to be free from. I'm not sure that I have a solution for that or not a solution that is a medical solution. So someone wanted me to touch on feudal care. Uh, I will say that I, um, I'm not sure what feudal care is. I think that if you talk about physiologically feudal care, it is uncommon. Care that I believe, quote, isn't worth it, or what I might call medically inappropriate care, I don't believe the values that it achieves are worth it, is more common. And yet what I think is most common is really bad communication skills about what I think is going on and joining with families. Because my sense is that most families, not all families, most families will do the right thing given time, support, and some guidance. I think they're at least as likely to do the right thing as some doctors who in fact, despite all the nurses and social workers and respiratory therapists and other doctors thinking, oh my goodness, this person's gonna die, the doctor won't quit. And so if we're gonna to touch on feudal care, my response is I'm willing to talk about families' decision-making for feudal care as soon as we talk about other healthcare providers' decision-making about feudal care. If we just focus on the family, it feels to me like we're picking on the most vulnerable. 
I've left only three minutes for questions, which means I'm not going to make very much money. But I do want to take any questions that anyone has. Thank you very much. I, I do have one other thing to say, which is I hope that everyone, after listening to this talk, do something to try to change the society to make it to be the society that you want to live in. Whether it's giving to an organization or making sure that you vote in your primary and in the general election, be the change that you want to see in the world. I'm not going to tell you what that change should be. I'm telling you that society isn't going to get better if we all don't act. Here, here, bravo. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we have a couple minutes for additional uh, questions. And uh, I do want to say that uh, we appreciate your willingness to touch on some of the related, very difficult and challenging problems that our society is facing that COVID has highlighted. Very important and thought provoking. Thanks. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a great day and you all stay healthy. Okay, great. Bye. Yeah, and thank you so much. No problem. Take care. All right.